Welcome everybody back to the Quiet Riot Show slash podcast. Um, I don't have an episode number because we haven't decided what it is yet. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna go by numbers. We're just gonna we're just gonna put uh, out stuff. Exactly. Talk about yeah. stuff. Um, just for those of you who are joining us for the first time, depending where this lands, uh, thanks for listening. And this is a show geared towards men's mental health. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of things. We're gonna sometimes dig deep we're sometimes gonna laugh we're gonna do anything that comes up this is just conversational men talking to men and uh for the record we are not professionals on not any of the subjects well our guest is going to talk about things he's been a professional That's right, at, yeah. but other than that no, we are not and professionals I, are not. about fucking anything <laughs> <laughs> so everything you hear here is just our opinions and our experiences and our guests experiences and what they did to handle situations or stories and whatever and if some of that works for you great and if it doesn't work for you uh sorry i don't know what to tell you (laughs) um yeah so i'm going to introduce our guest today we have a if you're canadian or outside of canada maybe um we have a veteran canadian football player professional football player we have a veteran canadian sports radio host and uh I'm kind of honored to be in the room with. Oh, actually, absolutely! Like, and honest. you know what? I have I'm not something. Gonna fan, I'm not going to fanboy, but like Troy, you're kind of like a thing. You're a known figure, and I've grown up in Winnipeg and lived in Winnipeg my whole life, and so it's. Uh, I I really appreciate you taking time to be here, and thank you. And we're going to talk about a lot of things, and we're going to learn a lot more about you than either Tommy or I knew before this. I'm looking forward to it, boys. For sure. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> thank buddy. you very much for joining us. Um, I. Um, I prepared something special. I know this is pastor time, <laughs> but I actually got one of the these hats and I never actually wore it before. Mm. So I'm going to put it on the first time and just kind of wear it during the show. <laughs> now, do you ever get sick of seeing bomber stuff? Oh, no. No? Like, is no. that in your blood? Like, you did, what, 18 years? That's a long, like, that's got to be in your blood. Oh. Yeah, and you know, I there's sort of two uh, book and parts of that. When I was five, we were living on Valhalla Lane in an apartment block, main level, and I said to my dad, one day I'm going to be the kicker for the Bombers. When you were five? When I was five. And I don't know if we... He used to always take me to the games. He had season tickets. And my grade one teacher was Mrs. McKee. So Walt McKee's wife, who was the kicker for the Bombers at that time. And I loved soccer. <laughs> oh, and okay. I just I remember saying it to my dad. He reminded me all the time about it. And then on the other side of that, um, there's the, I remember in year 17, st- I, I was spent a lot of you spend a lot of time by yourself when you're a kicker. In the, in Do the you? Locker is room. that is that? We'll get into that. Yeah, I'm there's a lot of self reflection and all the rest of it. But I remember stretching in the locker room. All the other guys were in meetings and just looking around and still couldn't believe that I was in there. It happened. Like it was just like yeah. holy. It's it's just such. It was such an honor. Every single second in that locker room, all the 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 ocean of memories and yeah. things like that man it was just such such a remarkable amount of fun that's mm-hmm. amazing i i hope we can unpack a little bit of that and i don't want to i don't want to focus all about your football career but obviously that's a really significant part of your life and there's a lot of things about that that i'd like to unpack a little bit and see how you felt during those moments and what that was all about so, absolutely yeah um one of the things we do on this show is we do a check in and so you know how that, before we before we get into the check in, I, I have a really funny story. And I, I believe because we've met a couple of times through our mutual friend, uh, Glenn, who is also a, a guest on this uh, show um, or will be, depending, uh, when depending we, when, when we release these. Yes. Uh, but uh, so you and I actually played a soccer game against each other at the Highlander. So uh, if, for those that don't know what the Highlander is, it's basically it used to be an ice ring, but they, I guess the, uh, the cooling system broke down and uh, they turned it into soccer. Is that field. why they converted it to soccer? Uh, that, that's the story I <laughs> really? heard. Budget, <laughs> budgetary reasons. But, well, I guess soccer which works. Is, which is smart because they also <laughs> yeah. make shit ton of money on that on yeah. the soccer too. Um, so I remember playing uh, playing against you. And I I knew you as a as a football player as a kicker. I never seen you before, um, you know. So I didn't know I didn't grow up here, and um, you know I didn't know any that that was you playing until, oh yeah, that's Troy Westwood on that team, and I'm like oh shit okay. And then I just right after a couple uh, shifts, I remember you kicking it from like the other side of the the blue line, and all I could just hear like. Whoosh, <laughs> And then my buddy like, oh, 
and then he's like, that's it. I'm off. And he walked yeah. off the field. He's like, he blocked one of your shots. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that story. I'm a soccer guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was yeah? a soccer guy guys... that was displaced for four years of college and 18 years with the Bombers. It's basically that's soccer what it was. was. Was soccer your oh, yeah. initial passion? It's a great sport. Sure, man. And I, like, I was a kid drafted by the Fury, which was kind okay. of like Valor before. I remember before. the Fury, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then had a I had a soccer scholarship offer in uh, Old Dominion in Virginia. And I was debating that or the uh, football scholarship. And at that point in time, I talked to my dad. And if you're playing pro soccer around here for Fury, you were making like gold eyes money, right? Yeah. Three, yeah. four, five grand yeah. back then anyway. Yeah. And or you had a chance to go for a football scholarship and try and go pro and play in the CFL. You're, you could, you know, you can make a living for yourself sort of yeah. thing. So that's why I decided to go forward with oh, football. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Nice. Huh. Yeah, I guess like uh, soccer, I mean, at some point it's going to take off. And oh, it's off. It, it, you it's, think it's, it's oh, off? It's, it's, it's happening? It's no doubt. Like it's, it's, so, it's huge everywhere but here. But I, but with, you know, we got Valor. We Like yeah. there is soccer activity And Valor is all you need, right? You got yeah. FC Manitoba, which is an intro to Valor. Then you yeah. got the CPL and Valor. They're drafting kids out of Canadian colleges and universities, yeah. and then you got the MLS, which is all over Canada and yep. very popular. It's yep. here, man. Yep. It's so the that environment. And I coach my son in soccer, U fifteen level. Mm-hmm. So these kids are looking at scholarships. They have the dream of playing okay. pro, yep. all that sort of stuff. And so th- that whole the environment of it and the opportunities there for uh, male athletes right now to play pro in Canada are j- it's night and day. It's in a great spot yeah, right yeah. now. Well, and it's also like hell of a lot cheaper than hockey. Let's oh, say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you still have the tournaments and all that, but as far it's as not equipment ten grand goes, when you're thirteen, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's crazy. that's pretty good. I mean, I, soccer injuries are freaking brutal, <laughs> but uh, that's one of the reasons I I kind of stopped doing even the the rec so- soccer. But uh, you know, it is it's, it's a great sport. I love mm-hmm. it, and I have to really uh, just kind of shout out the the Valor FC because like my uh, my dad was here visiting last year. From uh, I was born and raised in Slovakia, in Europe, soccer is everything, right? And um, so he he's one of those guys now. He's retired. So Monday he watches the German league, mm-hmm. and <laughs> you know Tuesday it's the Premier yeah. League, and it's yeah. the La Liga, right? Like yeah. every every day it's a different league. So he loves soccer. He knows all the big names. And so I took him to a Valor FC game, and he's like, you know what? This is not the worst soccer I've seen. Yeah, I'm like, well, you know what? That's, that's pretty good. That, that's a compliment. Coming you know? from a European, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, yeah, I really enjoyed myself there, mm-hmm. too. So. Well, and I think that, like, just to – we may as well go down the road yeah. a little bit, but, like, <laughs> this whole Wrexham, Ryan Reynolds, Rob McElhenney yeah, yeah. series, documentary fantastic, series. fantastic, yeah. Have you watched it at all, Troy? I have not. Okay. We, we're just getting – you know, we caught up to Ted Lasso. I was late to the party <laughs> I'm just Ted watching. Lasso. He's been bugging me yeah. to watch I'm that just forever. Watching. I'm it just was, season three right now, so – They, they, go, they really dive into a lot of social issues, which mm-hmm. you got to tip your cap to. Uh, but what I love, and and some of it, there's too, they spend too much time on the relationships of the show for yeah. me a little bit. Yeah. But every time they're in the locker room and just the whole oh, it's American fantastic. football coach in the you know what's really football. Yeah. Th- that whole thing is just brilliant. I gotta yeah, watch yeah, yeah. this show. It's, it's actually fantastic. It's and like really every well actor written. on that show uh, plays the character. 100% perfect, perfectly. Perfectly. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so fun. you got to watch the Wrexham thing. Yes. And yeah. I'm not, My wife and I are I, talking I, about that. Yeah, I've never been huge into football or European, yeah. whatever you want, soccer. Um, <laughs> but watching this like really ignites a bit of a passion for people. And Absolutely, yeah. It's two North American actors, one Canadian, which is great, yeah. and embracing this European football culture. And I really think that's going to be a springboard for like, soccer to take off even bigger and Mm -hmm. further in north america Mm -hmm. i really hope so i mean mexico soccer is everything Mm -hmm. it's huge so it's really just canada and the u.s yeah outside of the entire world (laughs) that is like "Ah, i don't know how we feel about this and i and i and i firmly believe we're way past that brother good that's good like you're getting fifty thousand at games at atlanta Mm -hmm. all kinds in toronto and bc and so it's so it's so i'm just just not aware how big it is okay awesome that's great i love that the one thing i I really hope that uh canadian hockey fans take away from the soccer fans is the cheering I love Absolute. you know, man. Like, I've said that for diving? decades <laughs> no. in the barns, right? If they oh. started singing and chanting the way they do at, at the <clears throat> in Europe, and it, that oh. would be so much fun. Absolutely, like oh I, I came. God, I uh, when I moved, and they do here. it a little bit in Nashville. 
Oh, okay. Right? Th- that's the closest ah, barn man, that, that, I love Nash, that right? mimics and rivals the spirit yeah, yeah, and yeah. the environment. Yeah. So the first time I moved here, coming from Slovakia, which, again, like the hockey is there. It's okay. Like, we, you know, the, there's been few great players from Slovakia, but the the, the extra league, it's called, uh, the, the top league, so, uh, hockey league, um, we would bring like the big fans they bring drums like literally yeah. you bring a bass drum or a snare or or a, it's like that at something. valor right yeah the music doesn't stop that's right and, the and then so I, yeah. I can't and it was just a moose when i moved here in 2004 you know but i was like okay let's go to a ahl game i mean mm-hmm. how bad can it be right and we get in there and like okay the game starts and i'm like Everyone's nobody's quiet. Everyone's watching so the game quiet, and right? they're quiet. Oh, yeah. oh, they put a sign up, make some noise. <laughs> yeah. So everybody makes noise and then they back to quiet. Yeah. Like, it just blew my mind, you yeah. know. But then, you know, I got used to it. But yeah, I wish I really wish that uh, you know, they take some some of It's funny cuz I wish that was the case at Jet Games and yeah. boy if it was ever with CFL. And sometimes game. It gets but when I'm watching, like I want to I'm just quiet. I just want to be quiet and watch, but when it's going on around me, I just love it. And when I'm yeah. you know, tuned into the La Liga or, or the EPL oh. and watching it there and even when going to Valor games here, like there's literally a section that does not stop singing yeah. the whole time. It's, it's beautiful to listen it's to. It's like old Section S at the Bomber Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> it pretty much is, yeah. So how much, and we'll do the check-in at some point here, but how much of that fan atmosphere influences the result of what's happening on the field? Something approaching or zero. Is it, it, I, it is? Yeah, I, I try and express that to folks. There was actually at the last Valor game, a guy who was tied late in that match, guy with a megaphone walking around, <laughs> get up if you want the team to win. And I was just looking at him going, like on the on the pitch or on the field or on the yeah. ice, and you know, certainly I was on the field, the football field, yeah. it's white noise. Yeah. It's just zone. Yeah. It is in completely zone. white yeah. noise, man. Like, yeah. And the first couple of times you're out there, you, you feel it and mm-hmm. or you hear it, and there are times – that you can feel the energy if, if there's a huge score and you know just the the noise and stuff but by and large it's white noise man yeah yeah every and like as much as fans want success on the field i, I you can take that and even you know folks are in a certain mindset about the jets right now and and not trying and and give a f factor yeah. all that sort of stuff but you can basically take i believe typically the desire of a fan to win a game, match, whatever you want to call it, and you, it's some exponential factor of players and coaches what they are doing yeah. to trying trying to win and how much they want it's to win. Just you know, so different. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I love it when there's there's friends. They're like, oh man, they they just suck today. Whether it's the Bombers or Jets, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not like they went there and like, well, you know what? I don't feel like trying to <laughs> win today. Phone it in today. Like these guys like- <laughs> really try to do their best you know sometimes the other team is just better or just lux on the other side and like or you have an off day like one of the yeah. new things i felt as a player is that some days you don't feel good yeah yeah you know it's, and then it's a mental i really like much props to you guys for having a show that focuses on men's wellness men's mm-hmm. uh mental health and it just that's really cool but i remember like a number of times at the beginning of games it's like i just don't feel good yeah. today and then you, know, you used to have the thing called like a biodex in the paper and stuff like that. And this is like, you know, when this maybe area wasn't even discussed as much or as openly yeah. and stuff like that. And it was always to me, it was a mental thing that you had to be strong enough and to, to tell yourself, OK, look, I'm st- the same being standing here capable of the same mm-hmm. strength and power, stuff like that, because I don't feel good doesn't mean I can't generate that yeah. same sort of right. power yeah. or concentration. Yeah. So trying to do that moments before a big kick or something like that when the game starts and in hockey like i when we were on tsn man and like that nhl schedule for pete's sake they, 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 oh they get goodness. paid fantastically but oh, yeah. Yeah. we as fans tend to think of our athletes as robots yeah. essentially yeah right and so when those guys are out there and sometimes their schedules almost every second night yeah. out there and you're expected to be at this incredible level yeah and if there's ever any sort of little slight blip at all Right, you get your well, and they're shifting time zones. They're back and forth between time zones. Well, I mean, they try not, not even taking that into in consideration. Areas. Right, they're All getting the on planes yeah. every day. Yeah. Like yeah. they finish the game. I I knew one of the equipment guys for the Jets for a little while, and it's like they finish the game, they eat a slice of pizza or two or whatever, yeah. and they're like undress and they're the fuck out of there mm-hmm. yeah. to get on a plane and get to the next place. Like that's right. That's I don't know what that feels like, but I would yeah. imagine that is 
unbelievably taxing mm-hmm. on your life. Just taking one trip, you know, on an airplane is still tiring. Whether you're flying to Toronto, you're yeah, still, but they're flying on charter flights at least. Well, they go through- but still, you know, it's just one of those things. Like <laughs> no, it's you're, exhausting. You're, you know, you're you're still exhausted, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it could be a three hour flight, but like it's yeah. still an effort. You got to get there early. You got to check in. Got to well, get you're on. Waiting and, yeah, on stuff. You're, and you're technically you're working. You just finished working, but. You know, Wait, why are we talking? We're still working. So, yes. It. Let's do the check-in because <laughs> I got a million things. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we do a check-in <laughs> where we use a number system. This came from something me and my wife do to check in on each other. That's cool, man. I'm super like steady and generally don't show my emotions the same way that she does. And she's like, I can't get a read on you. <laughs> We need to figure out how to manage this. That's cool. And so we use a number system. So every day or multiple times or whenever whenever it happens to happen, she'll say, what number are you? Or I'll say, what number are you? And so it's hmm. a one to 10 and it gives you an unbelievable grasp on, when, especially once you get to know someone a little bit, what where that person's at that day and what they need and how to serve them and how to how they need love that day and all those things. So that's really cool. We use that system and mm-hmm. it works unbelievably for us. Um, so we I'll, do that. I'm going to try it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> so as I get home, you should. So yeah. we do that here with each other and we kind of use because we've never met you. We use your general recent weeks, months, whatever you want to use. Doesn't Whether matter it's today but yeah, like, or for the week. You we'll, you'll hear us do it and then we'll we'll do you. But um Tommy, what number are you today, or whenever? Well, to be honest, I'm all, I'm a good good solid nine, eight nine, eight Oof, nine, yeah. That's uh, great. And that's just because I got to have my first drink today after a long twenty five days. That's right, twenty five days. Yeah, uh, both so of us. me and Tim decided to do this uh, this reset, and uh, because we're close to the end, we're going out to the movie today. We just kind of you know what, like we we've done our part, like we feel like we've done it, and. Um, and so we just got to have a, have a couple of drinks today. And, uh, overall I had, had a really good day yesterday and a couple of days ago too. So like, I'm in a really good spirit. Like even good. my, my wife's been really busy lately and I think she's a little jealous that I'm having a good day. You You're know, like fun, I've been yeah. really busy too, but like I've been accomplishing things like doing some work around the house too. So we got that done. So it just feels good. Like good. I only slept four hours, you know, but like. I'm doing okay. Good, <laughs> so man. I'm That's yeah, awesome. in good spirits. You've yeah. uh, last couple we've recorded you've been yeah. in that, like 8 yeah. 9 and yeah, that's, feeling good I'm lately. So to, that's good, yeah. Happy to hear that. That's good. Man. How about yourself? I'd say I'm a today I'm like a 7 7, seven. and a half. Okay. Maybe okay. even. Yeah. And yeah. I'm I so Troy I I generally sit at like a 7. That's kind of my mm-hmm. regular, my steady pace. And so if I'm at my steady pace, like things are pretty good. So I'm good. I'm well, uh, since you had the, had a drink today too. I, I had I a drink today. I had a whiskey point, today. Point, that that might be good, a yeah. seven and a half. <laughs> but like, I had a good day. My work week's been good. I've been enjoying the business I've been doing, the interactions I've nice. had, and like, it's just been a it's been a good week, and I feel good. My wife and I have felt connected this week, and that always has such Fantastic, an impact yeah. on like. My daughter and I have been connected this week. She was sick for a couple of days. Okay, but yeah. what actually happens when she's sick is like I stay home with her. Yep. And when I stay home with her, I feel more connected to her. Mm-hmm. And so Absolutely. it's actually my family. My family life has been great nice. this week. Like it's just been, yeah, it's been a nice Good. week. Troy, uh, go ahead. Give your give it a shot. Uh, seven. Okay. And I, I think seven would be around my medium as well, sort yeah. of as with you, yeah. So I think yeah, everything's... Run a just a, a somewhat demanding schedule with a couple of jobs and coaching my son's soccer and then making sure mom's happy and mm-hmm. and you know doing things uh, for me like working out and we have two four dogs at home two real oh, dogs yeah. Kane Corsa so always tending oh, to them God, as well and beautiful. oh they're so oh. beautiful man but yeah like seven you have four yeah two little three pound dogs I can't even remember what kind of dogs they are they're my wife's I call them shit rats I have a yeah, I, have a, I have a pappy on it's a six pound. Yeah. Red, so we got two love, three pounders, man. Though, and, <laughs> yeah, they're literally three pounds, and then three. the Cade Corsos are like one forty, one fifty. Oh god, yeah, <laughs> those are like <laughs> almost just horses. Beautiful, yeah. man. Oh, so my buddy beautiful. had a. He actually had a like living in Slovakia, but he had a champion uh, Cade Corso, and. Like literally, I went to visit him. Like, ring, rang the doorbell, and I knew I had to wait because if my buddy wasn't there, <laughs> I would be dead. <laughs> but they're, so they're I just beautiful. absolutely head over heels in love yeah. with them. Love oh. them. Yeah. So you have four dogs. Mm-hmm. That all because of my wife. Yeah. Good for you. That's okay. Share blame the wife. How many yeah. kids do you have? <laughs> Together we have four. Okay. So when I met my wife, she had three. Um, 30, 27, 24 now, and then together my wife and I have a fifteen-year-old. Okay. Okay. Nice. So you're like. Three of them are kind of on their own doing their yep. thing. Yeah, we still have mm-hmm. uh, the youngest of those three. Nico lives at home with us, and then, of cool. course, our 15-year-old does as well, yeah. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. All right. Well, so seven's check, good. Yeah, let's call seven's seven. great. I think yeah. seven's a oh, win. Like, I, yeah. I would call that a win for a period of time. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So um, the main reason I really wanted to uh, host you as a guest is I really want to uh, find out what is it to be a pro athlete and, you know, your whole life you're prepping to, you know, be in shape, to, to do your best in, in, in the, the sport that you're, you're doing. And at some point that career ends and it, I believe most pro, pro athletes end their careers a little bit earlier than, you know, if I go start working at a factory and just do the 40 years there and then, you know, I retire at 60. Right. So you, you were at the bombers for, uh, 18 years. Um, what was your last year that you've, uh, you retired in... I never I, retired. I got sorry. cut in yes, 08. Got, got cut. Yes, Let's be got clear cut. about yeah. that. He yes, got yes. fucking cut. <laughs> in the spring of 08, I think, 08, is yeah, when okay. I got cut. And then so, they brought me back for four more games in 09. So <clears throat> why don't... I, sorry, can I cut in for a sec, Tommy? Yeah, no, Just like, I, yeah absolutely. Give us a bit of your, your history. And so I want to talk about Troy Westwood before the Bombers, Troy Westwood as a Bomber, Troy Westwood as a radio host at 1290, and Troy Westwood today. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll cut in a bit and yeah, ask absolutely. about like sort of what that was that experience was like for you uh, mentally. If there was struggles, I, I'd love to hear about sort of how you pushed through that. I mean, you're a you're a good fit man living a good life at a number seven. So like he's killing <laughs> it. So we'd love to like expand on that and hear your side of that. So like a 50,000 foot view? Is Give what? us a 20,000 foot yeah. view of what that looks like or what that's been like for you. Okay. And we'll cut in and ask questions as you say things that you want to do that. I, I guess, yeah, like just maybe like first, like quick question, like when did you actually start to realize that you're going to, you're going to try to push your way into pro pro athlete like you know obviously like you started doing sport you said you mentioned you played soccer yeah soccer hockey football so from five that was on from like yeah back in the day when you could play those three sports the way <laughs> they were set up right you just yeah. play those as yeah. a rotation so you grew up in a very athletic yeah home yeah yeah my yeah my uncles uh four brothers on my dad's side were were all gifted athletically and all had their own little niche sort of thing and okay. i grew up around them so it was just always sports yeah and you know, growing up around that was awesome and then in high school for me it was sports number one girls number two school number three and but always like the the sports element of it was always really important and as a kid played like tier three hockey was okay as a goalie and stuff, but just, you know, didn't emphasize it or anything like that. Uh, 14, 15, 16, then soccer started getting really serious for me or at least started focusing on it more, always out practicing and stuff like that and played for the U16 provincial team, U18 provincial team, Got was involved with the national <clears throat> pool for a little bit and then also got drafted by the Fury 18-ish, 19-ish sort of thing. Okay. Um, That's a big moment. Playing with the premier team, Croatia. I was basically adopted oh, by the wow, Croatian nice. community here. Nice. Played with them for like 40 years, yep. uh, starting at about 15, 16. So always playing soccer for sure, uh, being around that and um, and being in sports, right? And the sports was always – I was had no idea what I was going to do with my life outside of somehow, some way playing professional sports. It was okay. just okay. one of those weird things. And then – So it kind of became a goal for you to, to be that – Athlete, it was yeah. almost like I was too like, ignorant you know? and naive to think of anything else. There just wasn't really anything else <laughs> yeah. out there that yeah. I enjoyed or <laughs> yeah. that I was drawn to. It was just kind of weird like that. Yeah. Now, at that point, like, did you just kind of know, like, I'm going to do this? Like, what was the confidence level at that point in your life? It wasn't even confidence, brother. It was ignorance. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> and naivety. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. there's some crossover yeah. between those things. Yeah. There, but, but it was like there was nothing else on the horizon okay. but playing just sports. life. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was like I'd, I'd school. I wasn't interested in any specific yeah. subject or anything like that. It yeah. didn't appeal to me. I was going to be a pro something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it just, um, and, and, and the way that I got my, uh, like scholarship offer, I was you know, just uh, misguided, misdirected. I think I graduated like 65% out of high school, just enough to get by, but didn't focus on it all. Didn't know what I was going to do. And then when I got the scholarship offer, uh, to drive down to South Dakota with my, dad and show them you know how you could kick i was playing touch football with my uncles and they kept okay, co- trying yeah. to convince me go show the bombers they could kick i played like a, th- a game or two for the lockport cowboys or a handful of them and kicked a 54 mm-hmm. yarder i think i was 15 to win a game and it was like front page on lockport paper and then 
I've played a few games. The Hawkeyes president drove out to our house in St. Andrews, Manitoba, and would drive me to a couple of games. So I played. I was playing football and soccer at the same time. My dad said, "Was like, look, man, you got to decide one or the other." Yeah. So I was like, "Okay, I'm going to pick soccer." So yeah. I kept playing soccer, got away from the Hawkeyes, but then started playing touch football with my uncles in the Manitoba Touch Football League. Okay. And I'd kick off and punt and for them and play receiver and DB and stuff like that. But, you know, kickoffs going through the end zone and punting pretty good. And they were like, you got to go show the bomber so I can kick. And I was like, oh, come on, you guys. And the team was – finally, yeah. I took a like bus down there. Right. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. took <laughs> a bus down there, and I believe the lady's name was Judy. She was um, elderly at the front. And I said, is there a coach that might be willing to watch me kick? And then – she introduced me to a guy named Urban Bowman, who was a coach there, and he literally took me outside. Like and you just me showed kick. up at the door, yeah, yep. just knocked on the That's door, awesome. like, "Hey, yeah. somebody watch me fucking kick this <laughs> exactly ball." Exactly what it was. <laughs> That's man. amazing. I took a bus. Do there. you think that still happens? No. Or was that like something the, the that entire, was a bit unique to your? The entire story that you're, I'm, I'm about to can't happen again. I don't think in this day and age. <laughs> so we went. I kicked. That's we went back to his office. He called Purdue University. Yeah, it was like a major That's American not a, school. That's no joke. Yeah. And they offered me a half scholarship right there. That was going to be like seven grand Canadian for my parents. I was like, there's no way that they can. I can't do that. So I'm working at a bookstore, enrolled at the U of M, uh, scholarship offer for Virginia uh, for soccer. And I'm working this book. Get a call. Hey, it's a head coach from South Dakota. Come or from uh, Augustana in Sioux Falls. So to come down, show us your kick. So I tell my dad, we drive down there. They bring me out to the 50 yard line field goal. Made field goal, made field goal, made three fifty yarders in a row. Four year full ride. They signed me right away. And wow. as I'm getting that's, back in the car, that's like shit from a movie, man. Yeah, as I'm getting back in the car, my dad looks at me, and goes, "Which one of those were you the most nervous for?" I said, "I wasn't nervous for any of them, Pop." No. That's how stupid, naive, and innocent I was. Like, <laughs> well, just, just thank, blasting and away. Thank goodness you were. Yeah. Like, do you yeah. think if, like, if you get in your head, like we all, I golf, I, I love golf, and I'm awful at it. And like it's so much mental, like so much yeah. of that is mental. And we touched mm-hmm. on that at the beginning, like yeah. just like what's it like having a bunch of people in the audience? And we'll get into that. But like, thank goodness for your arrogance and naivety. Not yeah. it wasn't <laughs> arrogance; it was just ignorance. It was or just, igno- sorry, ignorance. It was like is I was I too yeah. stupid to know the ramifications <laughs> of if I yeah. yank any. Or yeah. If I hit one out of three, I'm not getting a yeah. four. four Dad, year we gotta four, drive right? to yeah, South yeah. Dakota. Why? I'm gonna <laughs> kick some balls. It'll be great. All yeah. right, cool. <laughs> yeah. So we drove home. And at that, I was, you know, really just lost at home in Winnipeg. Yeah. Like, I was just kind of surviving, working at And he, when we, it ended up time for him to bring me to the school and drop me off in late August. Getting ready, he'd, He grabbed my face on both sides. He looked at me in the eyes, and he had these really dark, penetrating eyes. And he said, no one expects you to last year past Christmas. And That's in my a- head, I'm like... F you. Yeah. I would never say that to my dad yeah, these yeah. days. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. a different yeah. world. But, but I was just looking at him and I was like, F that, man. F. Like, yeah. You kidding me? And then that somehow inspired me. Mm-hmm. That was a, to you become that, competitive about school. So you turn that into motivation. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. And and I kind of, I turned all Alex P. Keaton from, I can't even remember what the show was called. Michael Fox played this character that he was all business and wore yeah, a, yeah. a shirt and a tie all the time. And that's the way I, what I did for school. And I, my, my first grade, my first report card, all A's. My parents didn't Serious? believe me. They did well, not you, believe well, me when I, they said, no, you just my dad was telling like, no us way. you were 64% yeah, I didn't even study, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't care. <laughs> no, but then I started, I was like, okay, hey, I'm going to start kicking everybody's ass in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. And it just worked, man. Whatever he said there, I, it was just the most remarkable thing. And so, it, you know, all the four years there was just awesome. The only Canadian. It was a it was a Lutheran school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in the Bible Belt. I'm the Ooh. only Canadian. Ooh. I'm a non Christian, the only non Christian. <laughs> yeah. So the debates were ferocious, right? It was a liberal arts college. You had oh, to take geez. two religion classes. It was me oh, wow. versus everybody, right? And my roommate, and we'd have debates till the sun came up. He ultimately goes on to get his doctorate in in theology because oh, really? of the debates that we'd had. Oh wow! And then because a professor <laughs> at that uh, school. And he told me just a few years, he said like 25, 30 years later, they still talk about me at that school because what kind of kid, non-Christian, goes to a Lutheran school in Sioux Falls? Nobody ever. Hey, just for the record, my wife is a witch and my, I sell weed for a living and my daughter goes to a Mennonite Christian school. So (laughs) she will turn out very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And then, and then I came back home. And yeah. I, in college, I couldn't hit a barn. 
could kick the hell out of the ball, but I couldn't hit anything. I went mm-hmm. then before I, then I got drafted by the Bombers in the like the last round, the second last pick or the last pick of the draft because they won the the Great Cup before that. And I went to a kicking school in Vegas. Um, learned a little. That was the first time I had been coached because nobody knew anything about kicking. It like hadn't been around so long. Technique. And yeah, like no one. I'd never had a skills. coach. Yeah. I, I didn't have to go to meetings in college. Like you, have, you'd have to go to special teams meetings. No, they just left me alone. <laughs> it's like <laughs> and hit I, the ball when you're supposed yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, you were playing football the whole time in South Dakota. Well, I wasn't playing football. I used air quit. I was a kicker, no. and, and like the whole campus called me kicker. And I did. They didn't let me it's play like the other position because I couldn't get is that a th- Is that a thing? What are you guys like the drummers or the, the oh, drummers yeah. of the band? Yes, like is that absolutely? Yeah. Okay. And now it's kind of it's evolved into long snappers are almost the the ones the most outside the circle because now that's that's all they do is long snap. For okay, teams. that's become a specialized area. But <laughs> yeah, kickers, punters, long snappers, they're goalies, drummers. Yes, yeah, okay. it's all in that. And and as a kid, I was like, well, I said, you said I played you played goal. goalie. Yeah, that's right. I so I had that. the double yeah. whammy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got the double whammy. <laughs> that says a lot about me. So probably. you don't like running, basically. <laughs> oh, but yeah, that's soccer, right? Soccer. Yeah, yeah I love. He loves yeah. running. I wanted. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to do wave. That's always right. wanted yeah. to play when I was down in college, mm-hmm. but they wouldn't let me play anything. So the bombers drop me. I drive home, and doggone it! I, the the first time walking into the bomber locker room, like when I was a kid, I Ritz Foods. I used to sell popcorn, peanuts, ice cream bars at Jets <laughs> yeah. games, bomber games. Yeah. And I, Get your fresh hot roasted peanuts. And now yeah. you're in the locker room. Yeah, locker room. Yeah. How did that feel? Uh, well, the legend, like, so this is 1991. They had gone that whole era, however many years, and win it in 84, win it in 88, win it in 90. I walk in, turn. I, so being a rookie is one thing because nobody's there yet, right? So it was rookie, it was cool. You're the, as soon as the helmet's going on, you're like, wow, this is incredible. And being around all of this, and Cal Murphy's the coach, and he's yeah. like, He's like a military old school dude. I'm like, yes, sir. No, sir. And he'd love me just because I would, was like that, yeah. r- raised like that. But when the vet showed up walking into the practice, I remember so vividly on the left side, Cameron Kennard right there. And then on the right, there was James West, Ty Jones, Greg Battle, Paul Randolph. Those are names of for old time bombers. They were just like royalty. Mm-hmm. And then you had the back, uh, the back of the room, with the old line, right? Like Walby and... Mick Awas and Chris uh, or Dave Black and Nick Benjamin and uh, like Lyle Bauer, just all of that weight in yeah. there. I was like, holy shit, this is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm in it, like I'm here, a part of this team. Yeah. And somehow, some way, I started hitting what I was aiming at most of the time when I was kicking, and then it turned into 18 years. Yeah. That's a long, like, that's a long stretch with one team. Yeah, like I and, think I, I yeah, and I, I've never been a professional athlete, but I've followed some sports and like people move teams quite a bit. They yeah. get opportunity, they move somewhere else. There's contract negotiation. You like you stayed with Winnipeg. Well, I tried for your to career. leave my third year, so it was always the NFL. Everybody in the CFL, players, officials, trying to coaches, get their way, want to be in the NFL because it's yeah. take your salary times it by ten. Yeah, yeah. So that was the goal, right? So I get there and I have a, a really good uh, first couple of years. And then uh, get an agent, and they bring get me. I kick for the the Chiefs, the Jets, the Niners, and the Cowboys in the offseason. Okay. And you know, t- uh, trying to be full go, ready to go in Winnipeg in March, right? Flying into <laughs> yeah. San Francisco to kick was challenging. I was at the yeah. Golf Dome at six in the morning before it was just it, it was tough, and I certainly wasn't my best. And and came close to getting signed in San Francisco, really close. And it was neat because then some of those there wasn't much of a relationship yet between the NFL and the CFL at all. And mm-hmm. they said to me, no one's come down here from the CFL and been successful. Why and why should we think, think that you're going to be successful? And then I remember I was um, sitting at a, a, with the Kansas City Chiefs, sitting at a lunch after kicking with another guy, and he's there, and uh, Marty Schottenheimer's there, who's like a big NFL coach, mm-hmm. and they all order the exact same thing, wings, fries, and a beer, and I ordered like salad, <laughs> grilled chicken, and a Diet Coke, and yeah. I was sitting there eating going, and I realized I made a mistake doing this. And they, <laughs> they signed the other dude. Really? Right? Uh, and I was like the weird Canadian, right, yeah, eating yeah, all yeah, healthy yeah, food yeah. and stuff. And then, Do you think that, like, obviously, I mean, I guess if it's level playing field, we could take oh, this yeah. guy or this guy. It's minute little things that, yeah. like, now no make question. the decision. No question. It's a mm-hmm. subjective, Fuck. right? It, it, yeah. Like that. It's just subjective. Yeah. So it didn't quite land there. And then had a, a chance to leave a couple times after that, like, to Edmonton and to BC once, but didn't want to leave. And Bob was always like, play your whole uh, – 
Bob Cameron, who's like my Obi Wan Kenobi, okay. <laughs> was like, "You stay with one team your whole uh, career, man. That's there's something special about that." And I thankfully listened to that, and, was, and especially my hometown team, right? So it was just that much more magical. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you said you St. Andrews, and like mm-hmm. you're a Winnipeg boy. Yeah. yeah. Born in Dauphin, raised in Winnipeg, and St. Okay. Andrews. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I always actually admired like you know you look at uh, and. I'm going to make some references to hockey because that's what I grew up with, hockey and soccer. But in the hockey, you know, like back in the 80s, 70s, or 80s, 90s hockey, you had lots of players that stuck around with one team, you know, like uh, Martin Brodeur. Like he was with the, the Devils for yeah. a long period of time, not necessarily probably for his whole career. But Now you look at a guy like Bobby Orr. Yeah. It was like Chicago. <laughs> and right? like at the end, like it's so often yeah. you leave at the end for a year or two just to extend it a little bit. It wasn't an option for me when it happened, but I came this close mm-hmm. after I got cut. This close, the, uh, the that same year, the Saskatchewan, so the, this is, the banjo bowl hadn't been created, or no, it had been created already. So the punter for Saskatchewan gets hurt. And I can't remember the coach's name, but I knew him pretty well. And I came this close to signing for Saskatchewan, specifically for the Banjo Bowl, to kick for Saskatchewan in <laughs> two thousand eight. Thank God you didn't. Yeah, and the only and I think Tillman was the GM in Saskatchewan, and he said it's just going to be too much of a circus. We, we yeah, can't yeah, do that. Yeah. But it was that, and it was against Doug Barry, who I had all kinds of trouble with. And I, thought, I can come back and kick in the Banjo Bowl against Doug Barry. Yeah. Sign me up. But yeah, yeah, that yeah. sounds fun. Kind of. Thank goodness it never happened. Yeah. But well, it was, that's just it. Like it just really it looks really nice on the res- resume. Uh, when you see mm-hmm. a player, yeah, I was with this team for, you know, 10 plus years, yeah. which is so awesome. So you would have seen a lot of guys come and go out of that locker room. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a lot. Thousands. And you were a mainstay. And so, like, what was what was all that like for you? Like, what was what was the team atmosphere off the field? What was it like on the field? What was the struggle? What would, Like, you've already talked about sort of you're the, the odd man out because you're the kicker, the drummer, the goalie, like that that atmosphere i think everybody kind of mm-hmm. understands what that means or a lot of people do but like what was that like for you being in that position for so long in the same organization well, it was really cool and i i've always i think one of the things i am by nature is observant mm. so I'm, I'm typically in social situations will be quiet but watch everything you know and so sitting in the locker room and especially having a mentor like bob cameron who played for 23 years all for the same team and having him as a resource for me, like he kept me out of a pile of trouble as a young player for sure. And then even to this day is just a remarkable friend, but watching everything and being in the position of a kicker when you're, you know, we would stand around if the practice is two hours on the field, we're standing around doing basically nothing for an hour, 40 minutes, you know, sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of watching, a lot of listening and you just, you learn a lot. So, you know, how precious, situations are when my first or second year there our leading receiver his name was Eric Streeter um, in the CFL you get uh, if you get if you make it to September then you're the rest of your contracts guaranteed so there's oh, okay. some financial situations that work into play where you know you might have a bonus or if you're a bit of an iffy player and they don't want to roll the dice and keep you they get rid of you before that September date hits oh, okay and there our leading receiver Eric Streeter everybody loved him he was leading the team in receiving I don't know what the what is a contract situation, but he got cut, bam, gone, Oof. of the room. And then when you're, you know, so that that hardens you, or you learn and you go, you take note of guys coming and going nonstop, right? Mm-hmm. So just understanding the inevitability of you're gonna lose your job one day, and you know you're sitting there and your best buddy can be right beside you one day and literally gone. Yep. The next day, it just yeah. and it just happens over and over and over and over again, when you're there for 18 years. So, like, have the perspective that you have of the preciousness of having the, um, the opportunity and the, the good fortune to be in that situation. You, especially in the final like eight or so years of it, where like breathing in the air of the locker room or being out in practice and you know being playing in games is so much fun, but just being cognizant of how precious it was and to live every second of it, knowing how precious it was, I think was really a a gift to have. I saw a lot of individuals that maybe didn't think like that and sort of took it for granted. Uh, And that's what I think, but just being very aware of the law of the jungle in that, in that environment, I think is a a good thing to have. 
Well, I love that you kind of mentioned that it's, it's, it's something that you really need to appreciate because, yeah, like you, you know, you get a, a, a partner uh, that you really get, or a, I guess a teammate that you really get along with and then you develop this relationship and he's gone. Like, you know, we talked about you go out there, you hear that white noise and everything, you're trying to do your best. But again, like things like that can really affect your, your mental state too, where all of a sudden this is your best buddy. And <laughs> that's all good. Sorry. Take it um, if you need to. But, and the best, the, the neat thing about that is, is it can't affect you. Uh, and yeah. uh, you, like have, you have to train to your, yeah, you, you have yeah. to train yourself. You become an expert at compartmentalization, which yeah. really affects a lot of other parts of your but life. But like the mental fortitude to be able to block out noise. Like I'm, I'm assuming you still use that skill in your everyday life. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's probably been... I would assume for the most part beneficial, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes detrimental, but like I would assume for the most part, that's a really beneficial skill to have to be able to block out the amount of noise that you've experienced. I have never had to go through. Mm -hmm. I, no. I can, I've had to block out people or things yeah. or situations, but like you've had to block out noise. That's beyond thousands that. of people. <laughs> yeah. Like never mind thousands of people, but like a team, a coach, a thing. Like yeah. I got to kick the fucking ball. Yeah. And so it's like, that's my job. I got to kick the ball. So when you're when you're actually so when it's your time to go on the field and kick that ball, um, you you kind of mentioned that you just you know go out and do it, but like does no, it, that was does, when I was a kid and yeah, didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was so, it like as a pro? But that's does it? <laughs> did it change when it, when you're a pro? It, does it create like a certain pressure? Like oh shit! Like this is like this kick makes the difference because it's you know, uh, five seconds to the end of the game, you only have that one kick, and if you don't make it. You, your team loses and sometimes that loss might be the last game of your season yeah. right like and it feels like it's what I've, I've always find fascinating about sport is whether you're playing watching for that split for that moment in time it feels like it's the most important thing on yeah. the planet mm -hmm. right it's and just, is that I important find that so neat or is that like is was that how that's you a great, felt that's a in great cos moments? cosmic question but oh absolutely okay yeah it feels like when you're playing and and it's still to this day i, I still mm -hmm. play soccer yeah. right and when we're in big situations I, i have that same sort of mentality and stuff like that but yeah so there's sort of a two-part answer to that question as to how you feel and think and stuff like that because until you have to manage failure you don't know what negative thoughts yeah. are and mm -hmm. like that whole demon in <clears throat> those demons in your mind that are You know, the bright yellow th miss word flashing in your head before you go kick or like you don't think about results at all. You don't think, oh, I can't miss this. Mm -hmm. Right? I tell I talk to our soccer kids all the time for pens. Don't go up there ever thinking you can't miss this. So, so when I was in college, I was never, ever had a negative thought. I yeah. was never fearful of failure ever. And in the early days of the bombers, I was still in that completely naive and. Uh, ignorant sort of mentality that like failure wasn't yeah. even a thought it wasn't yeah. it wasn't part of the equation but at some point in time you're going to be force fed yep. failure yep. and and then it's like okay now what do you do right and there's certainly different levels of it you're mm -hmm. missing if with me specifically miss a kick in the first quarter compared to miss maybe you're one and four four one for four in the game or you miss a game winner with three seconds left yep. that's very impactful right so there's different sort of Um, manner or little like differences and things of that nature but ultimately there's a quote by Roger Clemens that I came across early in when I was playing for the Bombers and it was it's my mainstay for the, like uh, and that and when I started playing in the early 90s it was before sports psychologist and and stuff like that right and like nobody really talked about that. the mental talking. aspect of the game <laughs> yeah. like it was pre Which predated huge. all that huge and it would have been very helpful but you also became that almost like if you lasted long enough and went through enough adversity and and that and you know yeah. lived through enough battles you became you could with, be a sports with, without having the letters yeah. behind yeah. your name <laughs> yeah. you've got a little bit of sort of street knowledge to yeah. it right mm. but Roger Clemens had this quote and it was consume your mind with thoughts of execution not with result okay. so yeah. instead of going out there thinking and you can apply this f really for anything in life I think I can't miss this kick or fearful to miss instead of that thinking of result you go out there thinking okay I've got two thoughts head down follow through to the target head down follow through the target it's it's awesome for golf 
right? So that's oh, yeah. for so for King. That's all I would have those two thoughts: head down, follow through to the target; head down, follow through the, to the target, and like nonstop repeat to myself. And and I, and then, but then there's those demons that are, are trying to pry into your mind, going miss. <laughs> and I swear to God, there, there there was a time when I was dealing with. As I was going to hit the ball, a big yellow block letters miss would be in my head. Like it was just the craziest thing. And then you're dealing with casting that out and stuff like yeah. that. So just the whole mental warfare of kicking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think any of those delicate, like I don't know that an old lineman, they would have different sort of things, right? That would be more um, almost primal or basic or like base, you know, foundational. I, I don't know what the way that they feel, but it's not like kicking is a delicate thing, the way yeah. golf would be, or curling, or or whatever other sport you want to talk about. But m- mastering as much as possible the mental part of the game is just absolutely monstrous. Mm-hmm. And how much of that mastery took you through your life outside of football? Or a huge, and, and sometimes to a negative way. Like sometimes, my ability to compartmentalize, which was absolutely essential. Like, yeah, you know, growing up, um, had you know, if a close family friend passed away, or if anything like that happened, and you play that day sort of thing, right? Like you have to put that in a box, stick close it, somewhere. it t- and bam, put. Yep. And so you become an absolute master of that. But in a relationship, like with my wife, for instance. Com- being a, yeah. a master compartmentalizer <laughs> isn't sometimes a great thing <laughs> to help nurture <laughs> a relationship. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. right. So that yeah, so it's there and and um, it causes like it causes you sort of reflection when you're applying it to your real life and stuff like that. But a pile of the mental skills and um, interpreting competition or motivating and things of that nature come into play in a huge way away from the game that you're playing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So okay. So after football, what was that like? It was scary. So it, it wasn't even after football. It was when you could when you could smell it coming. Yeah, okay. Right? So you knew. And, you know, I think I was 40 when I got uh, cut there. So like when you're 35, 36, and there was you're an already, episode in 2001 when I had a horrible big game at the Great Cup. And it, like at that point in time, it was, you didn't know if you are going to be employed, right? But when it was right there, it was just sort of a fear of the unknown. Like, what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Right. And especially uh, some guys are working because it's not like hockey, right? Where the guys are maybe made $40 million and they're, they, they can actually, again. or they can yeah. do whatever they want, sort of thing. In, in the CFL, you're, you, you have to start working. As right nice away. as yeah. the salaries are, they're not. Yeah. And they weren't not, that yeah. back then. Like, I remember my first year, I think we were making $28,000 yeah. a year. And yeah. every girl, you, when you went out to eat, was thinking you're making one hundred and fifty or 200 back then, yeah. which would yeah, have been like, decent money. But yeah, it it's not like reti- it. it's, it's a retirement contribution, but it's not, right. yeah. it's not going to, you know, you're done your career. You don't have to do anything. So yeah. after football. So it's just kind of scary. So I started, yeah. most guys, if they've got, if you've got your stuff together, most guys are working in the off season mm-hmm. or getting schooling, like preparing for okay, when building, the end comes. Right. So building yeah, that yeah, yeah. I just happened to get into social work while I was still playing. Okay. Uh, and that's something. So frontline social and uh, in this family reun- reunification, a beautiful program in the city. And so I was doing that. Tell and us then, about that a little bit, and, whether now or later, but I want you to tell us about that. Okay. Um, but when, so when I got cut, then that was full time. And then, and then because there's such, when you get cut, you're making pretty good money there and you got this one employment and then I ended up getting like two jobs at the same time with both places new that I had two full times. I'm trying yeah. to do that. Like just, you're just yeah. trying to survive and, and catch grip and stuff. Right. But it, at least like, but it was just a fearful, it was just more of a, what's going to, what's, it was, and especially like 18 years. So you're doing something all the time. Absolutely. And then it just like, it, it's almost, it's like a funeral. Because yeah. it's so abrupt. You, yeah, it's you, absolute. You, you, this was your life for yeah. eighteen plus years, right? And now all of a sudden, that's it's I not existing anymore. I think I was lucky because for some guys, it's their identity too. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, like it's even more than for me. It was almost more routine based than yeah. it was like my soul. Like I, yeah. you know, it's and I like I've always, as far as sports go, even I wasn't even playing the sport that I really love to play. Certainly the position of kicker, it just sucks, man. Like you're sitting on the sideline <laughs> yeah. forever. And then you go out and you touch a ball for a nanosecond and yeah. you're off. It's like yeah. being it a sucks. second or third or fourth pitcher. It <laughs> sucks. Like it really sucks. I hated it. I took me, I never got used to it. And especially cause soccer and the, you know, the pitch, 
and you're kind of a you know if you're decent enough you're kind of a general and controlling the game to yeah. some degree you're out there and you can hustle like there's no hustling and and kicking and stuff yeah. like that so that whole thing kind of sucks so being released from that the next day I walked onto a pitch in Winnipeg and it was like I just I remember this I remember the scene perfectly it was a blue sky the sun's out and I just exhaled it was like I'm finally home now oh, mm. okay that's the way I felt but but having that just severed so quickly but and but it was a little bit drawn out that I lasted as long as I did so it was just kind of a give and take a little bit of of the end happening but it wasn't it wasn't some guys I saw really struggle with it and I mm. suppose if you're 28 years old like I think of all these different ways that things that could happen to bring your career to an end way quicker and more abruptly and more horrible and things like that but I mean when you last 18 years you'd be pretty foolish to not understand that yeah, it's going to come yeah. to an end at yeah, some point you, like right? you got to think at that yeah. point it's just yeah. okay it's well and you said 35 36 you're already starting to yeah. sniff it a little That's bit right. you're like oh, yeah. okay the the how many more years yeah, of this am I going to get yeah. like it's tapering yeah yeah so you went on to so you left football you got cut from football, whatever you want to say. Um, you ended up in radio. Yeah. How did that come to be? Well, during the bomber, one of the neatest things about being with the bombers was that the the opportunity of things that were presented to me to do, you know, whether it was like racing cars at the Winnipeg Speedway and having like everything sponsored, and you just jump in and you're driving eighty miles an hour around a three eighths oval dirt that track. Sounds fun. It is so much fun, dude. And then like the noise. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to lots of those. There's races, twenty yeah. cars around and muds <laughs> flying all over the place, and that was so much fun. And then we're flying with the snowbirds. Like I've actually flown what? with the snowbirds. Really? Oh. And we're, like the boxing, I I had one professional boxing opportunity at a sold out Duckworth Center, five thousand people fighting some guy named Mad Dog Matthias Hughes or something like that. <laughs> just awesome. out of jail. How'd you do? Yeah. I lost in a decision. But I hey, survived. It was, yeah, almost like running, it. Yeah. it was almost like running a marathon for me, man. Yeah. It was like I used, I'll never the ding of the bell and standing there going, Holy shit, this I'm is still standing. This is actually real. <laughs> I didn't get right? knocked out. This yeah. is great. It was yeah. just neat. so all these different and like you know, the the community um I don't know that there was ever, like I can't out in public and it was before social media, right? So there's not all the vitriol and the yeah. trolling mm -hmm. and yeah, shit yeah. like that now that you've got to endure. I don't know that I've like ever to my face that anyone's ever said anything mean, negative. Because no, they wouldn't. Anything like face. that. But so <laughs> just always treated so well and, yeah. and, and in the community and it's such a, it was just such a, a beautiful thing and so lucky to be a part of that all. Uh, while it lasted, but I know I've I've swayed a long way from whatever the original question or statement was. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm uh, just asking about your career path after that. So yeah. you talked about a, a sort of an organization you were working with or something that you're working with, and you and we all know that you've been you were in radio for quite some time. Yeah, so I was working, and you sound good on the, a mic, so I can yeah, tell oh, yeah, you've, you've been in you've radio. You've done this before, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. So when I was playing for it, well, this is where uh, how it started. I was um, there was called, called the Buzz, uh, Gord Fry at ninety two, I think he was okay. at ninety two, and a bunch of other fellows were involved. Like Burton Cummings was there, and uh, one of the McLean brothers from McLean and McLean, classic Canadian sort of yep. dudes, and it was a music review show. It was about okay. a half an hour long, if I remember correctly, might have been an hour, but it was so much fun, and we'd sit around. Uh, kibitz back and forth and they'd play three songs we'd give our personal opinions on it and that was it high five and yeah. guys would have a beer that's or, a great or a show it was it was awesome man mm -hmm. and for years uh, maybe up to five years or so did that it was just so much fun I really loved it and then I'd also you know, as um, someone in the city get called to go and make appearances at radio stations things of that nature right yep. and ended up um, creating a relationship with Ron Abel and Caroline Hunter at, at okay. QX104. Yeah. And I, where to the point where if uh, Ron went away on holidays or something like that, I would go in for three, four days and co host with Caroline Hunter, which was just so much fun. And I get to do that sometimes now. It's actually pretty fun. It, what yeah. I love about radio, too, like I'm in, in, inherently pretty shy and quiet. And like if you're, you know, the folks that do morning breakfast TV and yeah. stuff, it's just a different deal, right? Yeah. But uh, you feel secluded. Like you're, you know, for all the radio I ever did is just like this. You're in a room with a couple of buddies yeah. and you're just having fun just talking back and forth. And, and, yeah, yeah exactly, it's so yeah. natural. It feels really natural to me and, and comfortable and, and bare, you know, yeah. it just feels great. And so doing that with Caroline, it was just a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. then, and then Ron Abel passed away and they called me into a meeting and, 
and said that they were possibly interested in me doing the morning show at QX 104. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And I had a, they were going to make me an offer. I had a number in my head and we were sitting at a restaurant and the program director offered me a number. It was three times more than what I was hoping for. <laughs> oh shit. Wow. No exaggeration. And I almost <laughs> fell out of my chair. I got to stop doing the one Oh six show for free. I think <laughs> yeah, is what right? I'm learning. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, Oh sure. I'll do that. So I did it. And for a little while with QX one of it was just all kinds of fun. The, those are like getting up at four every single day is challenging. Morning shows a different life, but it's pretty good. Yeah, it is. And I'm a, kind of a morning guy, so I don't mind that whole thing. And then at the same time as that's getting going, maybe about a year into that, there's a sports station that is open in Winnipeg. It's, I think it was just called Winnipeg Sports or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they were just starting to, there was a rumor that it was going to get going. And that's when the Jets were coming back. And that I think that was all kind of happening in unison. And then I got approached, uh, maybe it was two or three years after QX, I was doing the QX thing. And they... I just got asked to come attend a meeting. That they're gonna start a morning show. Uh, I was it was with Jay Richardson. Chris Brooke was the PD. I love Jay. And I was Jay's meeting. Awesome. Yeah, I love Jay too, yeah, man. Jay's and, a good dude. And I he was gonna be the uh, co-host, and he just meeting with me to see what he thought of me, sort of thing. We sat yep. down at a had a dinner or had a lunch, and it was just right away felt super comfortable with him, and and that was it, man. And then I started with uh, Winnipeg Sports. It turned into TSN. Yeah. And then that lasted ten years. So I look at my life. And was I, it 10 years? 10 years, oh, man. Wow. Played like pro ball for 18. Shit. Did sports radio for 10. Right. And and it was so much like the sports. It was such a wicked, easy, fun gig. It was ridiculous to get paid. Mm -hmm. Even more ridiculous than pro sports. Like you're yeah. actually paying us for this to sit around, talk <laughs> about sports. Yeah. Right? Sorry, 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 like talking about sorry it, yeah. we're not paying you today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're still, you know, we're still trying to get sponsors and all that. So it like, not no, but it's crazy. It, but, but really, if you're talking sports, who better as a Winnipegger, a historic one and Winnipeggers love Winnipeggers and like who better to have than someone who stuck around here forever, had a tenure in, our football team had a history living here. Like that's a, you're the right fit for that. It was really neat because the amount of the most common thing someone would say to me is, man, I hated you when you were with the bombers, but I really <laughs> like you now. You get that all the time because nobody knows you Yeah, when they're watching or you're on TV or at the game, right? They say that idiot kicker missing field, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. But then when you're in the genre of, of radio, you're talking about your life, your kids, yeah your thoughts and your feelings and all this sort of stuff. It's and all it's just, out there. They really, like, mm -hmm. I think it's really cool how people really get to know you. Yeah. So I'd, like, be at a movie or be in the popcorn line or something, and my wife would make me laugh, and her head would turn back right away. Like, yeah. Because they hear your laugh, and they yeah, know yeah, your yeah, laugh yeah, every yeah, single yeah. morning. Oh, I know that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So you really become a part yeah. of people's lives mm -hmm. yeah. doing the, and I and guess daily. any sort of like, You're a daily. part of people's routines. Every routine. day, yeah. Well, it was and, really and beautiful. I kind of wanted to actually, this is a question I had earlier when we were talking about your football career, too, that, um, you know, there's that, that part where, uh, as a kicker, you, you probably hear that all the time. You have one job to do, and then you miss that <laughs> kick, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> dealing with the backlash of missing that, kick for whatever the reason was right like uh that must have either like really destroy you or help you build confidence that you know what shit happens in life right but like okay let's move on and uh um, just build a, like i one thing that until the still to this day and i know this bugs my wife a little bit because maybe someone will say or do something to us or the family-ish sort of thing or mm -hmm. the kids I just don't care what anybody thinks about me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. Like I, I know, I know, well, it, I know the what I am and who I am and yeah. what I represent and all the rest of it. And if you don't like me, then just and, f and, off. And that's of well, and that's a, that's just it. So as a as a as a, so, a football player, you you had to deal with negativity in life, right? Like just yeah. coming from like fans. But it's really nice to hear that as when you got into the radio, that people were actually like, oh shit, I really enjoyed that episode. I, you know, like we did a crappy podcast with a couple of friends and like, if I had one person tell me like, man, I really enjoyed that episode. It just made me feel so good. So when yes. it, it's nice that you, you went from, you know, one, one career where you dealt with positive and negative comments and then you won't move into the next big but career. Some of it was positive and negative too, because yeah, yeah. you know, Jay and I would argue all the time. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> and with Jim Toth, I'd argue all the yeah. time. Matt Libel was a we'd argue, and people think, are you guys? You don't like each other, but we no. love each other. But yeah, we're yeah, just yeah. talking about something we're both geeked up and passionate yeah, yeah, about, yeah, exactly, right? yeah. and we're making good content. Like, like, but we're not, we're not even yeah. trying. Like that's the one thing. It was never yeah. staged ever. It was just yeah. raw. Yeah. And and I'm 
by nature when I communicate, I get revved up and talk, and it's not personal at all. But I'm just like I'll engage and go. And let's go at it. If we disagree, and yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So what are you? So radio, what's going on with you now? So, yeah, so that came to an abrupt end. The yeah. TSN, they just yeah. pulled the carpet out, and like we had our numbers are great Which in the radio morning. Is like I've learned from friends. It was like radio pro sports. I actually like learned that. Fucking bleh, yeah, today, no matter. Yesterday your show's great, and today you don't work here anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I noticed that in a hurry in radio. Yeah. That it was a lot like pro sports that way. It was mm-hmm. just one day you're there, one day you're gone. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so when I just by chance, um, a dear friend of mine, someone that was on your show, Glenn Damon. About two months before the carpet was pulled out here, uh, the market of TSN, the radio, he called me and said, hey, man, I might have something for you that you can't say no to. And at the, I was kind of like, oh, that's awesome, cool. We'll talk about it one day. He, he Sounds said. like something Glenn would say. And then yeah. and then that happened. He yeah. called me that day. He called me like an hour after it happened. And he said, okay, rest for go rest for two weeks, and I'll give you a call. He called me. I started training with the company. It's called Gustin Kwan, a local company. Yep. Consulting and digital Gordon, growth right, company. Yeah. I just absolutely the culture is remarkable. I love it. It's my the favorite job that I've ever had in my life, and that's Amazing. what I've been doing. That and I also do uh, like a mentorship program in the city for years and years uh, as well. So What's that about? Two things. Tell us about that. A just bit. just helping young men navigate their way through life really is what it comes down oh, to. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Uh, is there a website or some, feel free to plug uh, plug that if you'd like to? Th- there's or? not. There's not a, a website. It's, it's just just uh, on. Like a small army of individuals okay. helping youth in the city and that sort of thing. That's you know? amazing. Oh, fantastic, yeah. And well, have you been, like, has that been something that you've been sort of connected to or felt pulled to or drawn to for a number, like a long time? Yeah, I don't know. I just kind of, more or less, uh, from the early stages of being in that, that family reuni- reunification program, which is just a, a beautiful program, they would uh, basically help. At that time, it was you know ninety percent of the time single moms that were dealing with a multitude of issues <clears throat> that were trying to get their children back from the CFS. Okay. So you're trying to help them find their way and get grounded and rooted again in health, um, and in a situation where they were capable and given permission, basically by the CFS to to have their children back. Mm. And so sometimes that would include the father. Sometimes, most of the time, it wouldn't. But often, it was a family sort of thing. And and watching that happen, watching people, and ninety percent of the time there was addiction involved. So when the the internal switch flicks for someone to say, "Okay, that's enough of the addiction," and they start to get healthy with their life, and just watching all those sort of beautiful things develop in a positive way, and see them get re uh, introduced and involved with their children was such a beautiful thing. And then it just kind of grew from that and getting always sort of being somewhat involved to the youth, the male youth in the city and the province because of bomber stuff. And, and, uh, I was also traditionally adopted by a family in Seguin first nation, uh, Dave and Oriana Crescent. So a lot of the traditional teachings and stuff like that, uh, came into play for that. And, and then all the different uh, reserves communities through our music or through stuff like that. It was just became a, a part of me a little mm-hmm. bit. So just helping out, young men yeah so is Fantastic. this something that like what when did your desire or calling let's call it a calling not a desire um to do socially not responsible but socially generous or socially whatever you want to call it acts as a as a pro athlete or was this separate from you as a pro athlete like what was that to you i think it was very separate and i i've always been very like um an activist, I guess. And I think what, for the, what really pushed me into it was having strong feelings against domestic abuse and witnessing so much of it in the community, whether it was first nation community or in the city in general and and seeing the ramifications on beautiful kids and, and moms like helpless moms and those situations, stuff like that. And just that, that's, that's what really was the driving force to me. And then Mm -hmm. the missing and murdered, women yeah. in Winnipeg across Canada got involved musically like wrote songs about that stuff got involved with some of those organizations communities and stuff like that so it's just sort of from a social standpoint um, and being an activist it's just all sort of interwoven somehow good for you that's yeah. awesome um, we're getting to the end uh, end of the show but I really wanted to uh, just maybe touch base on a little bit of 
on throughout throughout your your two careers as a pro athlete and uh, as well as being as a broadcaster um how much uh how, how much of an effect is it on your on your personal home life like being a pro athlete like obviously you know you're you're training you're going on the road um you know did you take your family with you uh how how does that work because i have no clue at all like what what well how much pressure does it put on your family well i also was in music for like typically when i was with the bombers the summers would be football and then the winters on the road with eagle and hawk or as little okay. and hawk right yeah, so yeah. just okay. constantly yeah. on the road so when I met my beautiful now wife Janet that was very stressful the, the music was way more so than the football because mm-hmm. the football you're away for two days yep. you know maybe two music, and a half days sort of thing. for two and a half months gone, yeah, yeah. Or, or a week <laughs> or, or two sort yeah. of thing um, so yeah the, managing that and that's actually what when I stopped um, playing a lot of music was when we had our son and I remember we came I came home from a tour and I had just released my third solo or second solo album at that point in time and and she looked at me, and I think we were away for two weeks, and she said to me, I didn't sign up for this. And I said, what do you mean you didn't sign up for this? I'm an, an, an artist. Like, I'm, I'm a songwriter. This, yeah, is what yeah. I, this is what you walked into. And just, but recognizing her feelings. And then also, so many friends in the music business that mm-hmm. were, you know, my age now, right? 40, 50, catching the bus on Corden, who were way more talented than I was. And, and observing that yeah. and going... I don't want that life mm-hmm. I no, and it. I, and I don't yeah. want to leave. I don't want to be away from my son. Yeah. So I just, and, and the last sort of what really was the cherry on top was doing the morning show. And then we had a gig in the paw. So after the morning show at 10, 10 30, oh. we pack up our stuff. We drive to the paw. We do the gig, drive home. I sleep on the floor of the boardroom at TSN <laughs> for 15 minutes, and literally. Get, back on the get show. up and we're yeah. doing yeah, the yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah. That's never happening again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, it's, and it, you know, when you don't have a wife, when you don't have kids, when you don't it's have people, way different. It's easy. It's different. I'll yeah. do that yeah. shit yeah. all day long. Absolutely. And I did that. Like yeah. when I was touring with my band, we I would do that any day of the week, and I reveled in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But being responsible for other people and their oh, futures and yeah. them needing you is yeah. Uh, yeah you have to change like it it just doesn't that life doesn't work no for a lot of people i'm sure for some it does uh it might yeah, but yeah. i would question that it works for anybody that way because yeah. you can't be that detached from your your family and your love and your kids and yeah and, and one of the best things of that tsn gig specifically is you get up early and you i i as the individual am paying the price for and every night, I was never going to sleep before eleven, and often to twelve. You oh, had to watch you the games. Up that late, eh? You had to watch the That's games, my life and now. I was <laughs> too busy during the day to take a nap, sort of thing. So yeah. four or five hours would yeah. be a max of sleep. And then up at four. Up at four, but home every every single day. Pick up my son from school. Yeah, yeah. And then the entire evening was his for coaching soccer, which is almost like we're running a national program at this point when they're U fifteen. But since he was five. Till his till current, I've coached him in soccer. My e- whenever needed evenings yeah. there every single day, picking up from school. So it's just it's that's been magical. That's great. That's yeah, awesome. Excellent. Good for you. Fantastic. Well, uh, we'll end it there. Yeah, yeah. Troy, we, uh, thank you so much for making time to come chat with us. And pleasure, uh, really, really Anytime. appreciate it. I mean, I feel like we could be sitting here for two more hours yeah, and just, yeah, just chat. Yeah. Just the tip yeah. of the iceberg. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe we'll have you back someday, but us and uh, I'm sure our listeners and everybody, we really do appreciate you being honest and open and having that conversation with us and letting us pick your brain a little bit. We don't get opportunities to talk to people with colorful histories like yourself. And so no, we really yeah. do appreciate when we get that chance. Um, so. I'm going to just get you to open that door yep. and there's a little box there oh, yeah. that I forgot to grab. Um, do we have a little present for you? Uh, we we're doing we started doing this for our guests. Um, it's uh, it's just a little nice. appreciation um, for for you. It's a it's our show's mug, <laughs> official awesome. mug. Awesome, that's cool, man. <laughs> Thanks, boys. No, we really appreciate it, and we we actually, you know, the response we're getting from people when we talk about what we're discussing and and it's men's mental yeah. health. We want to tell our stories, and we want is. Uh, so overwhelmingly positive mm-hmm. um there is a need and a desire for a lot of men to have these conversations and and be a part of them it's so, so neat i don't know how old you guys i'm gonna guess you guys are 40 ish i'm by 40 the look i just you. turned yeah. 40 yeah. i'm 37 yeah okay so <laughs> but just stop drinking. The baby. It's, yeah. it's yeah. so different yeah 
na- like as a say t- compared to my dad's generation. Oh yeah. Never a peep about right? nothing. And then when I was a shit. kid, it just it was the same thing, yeah. man. And it's so neat how like basically it's an area of men's well-being and health that's been revolutionized in the last I don't know 10 years sort of thing yeah, five I'd years say. in a huge way but it's just <laughs> yeah. amazing how different it is so Absolutely. tip of the cap to you boys it's awesome and thank, thank you, you for making time to be here to do this with us my pleasure okay take care see ya all Quiet Riot Show episodes have been recorded and produced by Suvu Media. If you think you have an idea for a podcast but don't have the space or proper equipment, please visit suvumedia.com for more information. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please hit the follow button and leave us a review if the platform you are listening on allows you to do so. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Quiet Riot Show, and follow us on the Instagram page, at Quiet Riot Show. Please share this episode with others that may be interested in these topics. If you know anyone that would enjoy these topics, feel free to share our podcast with them. Also, let us know what topics you'd like to see covered in future episodes. Get in touch with us in the comments on our channel and social media, or send us an email to quietriotshow at gmail.com.